This is the time in our service every week well, where we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, this is communion or the Lord's table. And we like to draw our attention to a passage of scripture that will lead us in thinking about the death of Christ. And we want to do that from God's word. Uh, we have Bibles here. If you don't have a Bible, we want you to have one. Uh, some men are coming down. They'll distribute Bibles for you. Just slip your hand up. Let these guys know that you need one. If you don't own a Bible, uh, this is a gift for you to keep. We would love for you to have God's word uh, for yourself to be able to read. I want to turn your attention this morning as we think about the death of Christ to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. John 18 gives us the lead up to Christ's death on the hill of Calvary. This is the scene where he is being tried before a, a Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. We read in verse 28 that they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium and it was early and they themselves did not enter the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. Here you have religious hypocrites who don't want to be defiled as they set out to murder an innocent man. Worse than murdering an innocent man, innocent of some local charges. They are setting out towards deicide. They want to kill God in the flesh. And, and they don't want to be defiled by their rules as they go about it. Therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They had no answer. All they could say was, well, if he didn't do something wrong, we wouldn't be bringing him. In other words, they had nothing on him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves. Judge him according to your law. The Jews said, we're not allowed to put anyone to death. More hypocrisy and lies. They had tried to put Jesus to death time after time after time. They wanted to throw rocks at him in some corner of the city. They tried to throw him off a cliff. And in none of those circumstances would Jesus allow himself to be killed in that way. Jesus is going to a very public trial, a very public execution, a very public declaration of his innocence, and then a very public declaration of his title. The Roman governor will actually put on the top of the cross, King of the Jews. All of this is going to be very public, followed by a very public burial and a very public resurrection seen by over 500 witnesses. Jesus couldn't die in secret. Jesus couldn't be thrown off the cliff at the wrong time. Uh, Jesus couldn't be stoned to death in some obscure alleyway of the city. Jesus was going to hang between heaven and earth on two beams of a Roman execution instrument, a cross, so that all the world could see that Messiah came in the first iteration to lay his life down as a ransom for many. That he would hang before heaven bearing the wrath of God against the sins of all who would believe. And that he would hang above men as an emblem of mockery and scorn and shame and ridicule. Rejected by humans and in those moments rejected even by his father. So that he could take the full cloak of sin and wrap himself in it. So that he could satisfy the full justice of God against that sin. He wouldn't do that in a dark corner. No less than he would rise from the dead in secret. All of this was public. And so we gather today together publicly to proclaim his death until he comes. We like to do this every week. We like to tell one another and tell our own hearts and tell a watching world that we have a savior who has forgiven our sins by dying on a cross and our king's coming back. That is why we do this together. There will be a, an awkward moment of silence in a moment. And that is an opportunity for you to examine your own hearts. 
1 Corinthians 11 tells us some of the things we're supposed to be doing here. We, we go to God to confess sin, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just. There's no dub, double jeopardy with God. He doesn't punish Jesus for our sins and then punish us for our sins. No, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And believer, you take a, a piece of bread and a cup of juice as symbols of the fact that Jesus has wiped the slate clean before God and you stand just justified before him. And you confess what you know to confess, and Jesus is faithful to clean all the rest. We celebrate that when we do this together. And then it's also an opportunity, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, for you to examine your hearts. You, am I right with Christ? Do I know him at all? Are there sins unconfessed that I need to take before the Lord? And then we rejoice together in the forgiveness of sin. This exercise, these symbols, this practice is a remembrance and it is individual and corporate. Sometimes you, you may have noticed that we, we take the bread and the juice individually. Uh, take this on your own after you've examined your heart. Sometimes we ask you to hold on to those things and we take it together. Let's do this together in remembrance of him. There are advantages to both approaches. If, if we always take it together, it can very easily be a ceremony. Something that becomes rote and we just do it. Oh, everybody's doing that thing where we... Th but also when we do it together, there's a corporate expression. We're all together in Christ. This is communion. We're, we're communing with him and with one another on the basis of the blood of our Savior. There are pros and cons to taking it on your own. The, I, I think the advantage is you go to the Lord in prayer. You confess your sin after you examined your heart. And there is a vertical singularity with you and God. It's my sin that placed him on that cross. It was God's justice that held him there. And he did this for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're still all doing it together, but you focused on this is me and God alone. I stand before him alone on the basis of the blood of Christ. And so sometimes we take it together. Sometimes we take it alone together. Whatever the case may be, we must do the same things. Remember Christ Jesus. Proclaim his death by these symbols until he returns. Remember the gospel. Examine your heart. And this exercise is only for believers. You don't have to be a member of Grace Bible Church to participate in the Lord's table. You just have to be in Christ. If you've had your sins forgiven and you believe the gospel and you've turned to him in faith and repentance, this is for all of us together. If you're not a believer, the invitation to you is simply consider what Jesus did at the cross to pay for sins. Unburden your conscience before the Lord and find forgiveness with him and life and eternal life on the spot that you believe. And if you won't believe in him, just let the juice and the bread go by. It's not for you. Glad you're here. Glad for you to hear these things. Uh, they need to be etched into your memory and you need to walk away thinking that you need Christ because you do. Uh, but this is an exercise that we all do together. I'll invite the men, come on down. And they're going to distribute those elements, the, the bread and the cup. Uh, take those today, hold on to it. And we'll take it together. In the meantime, in those moments of silence, examine your heart. Confess known sins. Rejoice in the blood of Jesus, cleansing you from all unrighteousness. And I'll lead us to take the cup and the bread together in a moment.